Discord. Okay. So yes, always chaos. Okay, this isn't actually what I want, but I don't want to show you guys that book. Uh, okay, so let's start with this. Yes, all the future stress. But it's cool that you guys are kind of thinking about it now and being like, how can I, you know, prepare to make future me not, you know, die? Um, and so that's super awesome. All right, so this week we've been talking about integrals. And uh, I know that some of you have seen integrals in high school, right? Like calculus is always kind of weird that some people, the, the curriculum's not set. And obviously that's gonna vary as well as you, not only uh, even within Canada, but for the international students and some people taking IP and, or IB, sorry. Uh, and it's gonna be, you know, everyone's gonna be all over the place. So some of you have learned about integrals and probably if you did, you learned about Riemann sums and all that. And we're gonna ignore the Riemann sum stuff. And for us, the remember, the integral is just the area under the graph on the specified domain, right? So we're asking you, if you take the graph y equals x, what is the graph under that function on the interval negative 2 to 2? Okay, and yeah, yeah I, I hit record. It probably shows up on your screen, right? That it hit record? Does it show up? Yeah, it should be at the top left next to the security check mark. Yeah, it says recording, right? Yeah. But thanks, I, I appreciate that. Just making sure that we have it. Yeah, no, for sure. No, it's better safe than sorry. That's totally okay. Okay, and I know that some of you know how to compute this as well, but you know, at this point, Theoretically, we, should, we don't need to be able to you know, compute uh, these integrals. It's just like, what is the definition of this thing? And, and can I figure it out just by looking at it? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> There's a good distractor here. I didn't even think. I don't think we put up. Um, yeah, definitely. Okay, so we're at sixty-six percent. Let's do so. Two thirds of you have answered. Let's do another thirty seconds or so. We'll get this in. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I was always good at math. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, math is hard, right? And it doesn't matter who you are. Math is hard. You ever met anyone who says math is easy? They just haven't done enough math. Uh, the only thing that changes is when you decide that you think math is hard, right? But everyone thinks that math is hard. So there's it becomes a grind at some point, no matter what, right? Maybe, you know, actually in terms of like pure mathematics, it's, it's very much like uh, there is a lot of Asians, but it's pretty well distributed throughout the world. You know, I think uh, the kind of Asian stereotype is more for like arithmetic sort of thing, but pure mathematically, for example, the Russians are phenomenal, um, yeah, especially at their things like Norwegians are great at functional analysis. The Japanese tend to be like more uh, algebraic geometry, you know, these sorts of things. Um, okay, so uh, here, I'll answer those questions in a second. Um, so we are kind of overwhelmingly B, B was zero, right? And uh, yeah, that's correct. So, and there was, like I said, there was kind of a distractor, which I, for whatever reason, didn't put in here. Um, but let's kind of go through it for those of you who maybe didn't see it. I don't see why this is true. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's just kind of draw a rough picture. And for these early things, we're going to draw pictures because they're definitely going to make our lives really, really easy, right? 
So we've got y equals x. And we're going to do it from negative 2, or sorry, that's positive 2. We're going to do it from positive 2 to negative 2, right? And it's the area beneath the graph, right? That's the definition of the integral. So it's the area beneath the graph. However, it is the signed area, right? And that's very important. So what do, somebody tell me very quickly, what do I mean by signed area? When I say that we're computing the area beneath the graph, but it's the signed area beneath the graph, what am I saying? OK, well, what's negative though, Sarah? So you're on the right track, but like, what, what is negative? Right, OK, yeah, the red part, yeah. And yeah, uh, do I remind you got it too? Yeah, perfect. All right, great. Yeah, lots of, lots of great answers. So the red stuff here is negative. And the reason it's negative is because it's beneath the x-axis, right? So any area that's beneath the x-axis is going to be a negative area, and anything above is going to be positive. Now, you can actually run through these, and you can compute them separately if you want. Um, alternatively, what you can see is that the blue area and the red area are exactly the same. Hopefully, my diagram makes that clear. But these areas are exactly the same. And so it doesn't matter what they are, because they're going to cancel each other out. Right? And that's why you're going to get 0. On the other hand, let's do it very, very quickly. Let's actually compute the area separately and figure out what they should be. So if we look at the blue area here, it has uh, so the blue area. So this is a triangle. right? We know what the area of a triangle is. It's 1 half times its base times its height. Okay, its base is certainly just 2, right? Because we're looking at the interval 0 to 2 here. So its base is 2. And then its height is f of 2, right? But our function here is f of x equals x. So if I plug that in, I just get 2 as well. All right, and so that would give me an area of 2. The red area, again, I said it's exactly the same thing, All right? 1 half times base times height. The bases again, like I'm going to throw in the negative sign when I'm done. Let's just compute the area right now. So it's one half. The base is two. The height is also two. Uh, so that's going to give me an area. Oh, actually, you know what? Here's if you're wondering why it's negative, why area underneath the uh, the x-axis is negative, it's right here, right? Because this height, if I plug in f of negative two, I get negative two, right? So we, in that case, we'd say that the height is negative 2, and that gives us our answer. So the reason why area beneath the x-axis is negative is because we're always going to do whatever the function value is at that point. And so if you're beneath the x-axis, the value of f is negative, and that means your area is negative all around. Okay, So that's the idea. So you can see here that in this case, we get plus 2 and minus 2, so if you add them all up, you get zero, right? So the area is zero. All right, so that was B. If that's the case, then X equals negative two. So actually in that case, the, you know, that's an interesting idea, Chi Feng, which is like, are we also saying that negative area, like if you're on the left of the Y axis, why wouldn't we say that you have negative, um, you know, a negative width. Uh, we don't in that case. Uh, with the, the, you know, if you have a triangle, it doesn't matter which way the triangle is, I would say that the width of the triangle is still two, right? Just because I measured from negative two to zero, that is still a width of two, right? Um, or if you want, just take my word for it, the only thing that matters is the sign of F. There's a reason for this. It's because of if you actually build it up from uh, Riemann, in, uh, Riemann sums, you'll see that the negative sign only depends on kind of the f. So you might just have to take my word for it. Um, but in this case, it's only because the sign of the function is negative, not don't worry about the interval itself. Can we write that as 1 half 2 times 2? Absolutely. I think that's OK, Tian. Like, you know, we're not super worried about where that minus sign comes in, as long as there is one somewhere. OK, any other questions about that? Is that OK? Does that make sense? Hopefully so. All right, let's uh, switch it up a bit. Let's do something similar, but just you know, a little bit different. All 
And again, for those of you who do know how to compute these things, right? I know some of you do. Why don't you just try and do this one without being able to compute it, right? Like without knowing the trick to computing these things. Like try and actually draw this thing and I want you to do it geometrically. And the reason for that is, is that you can imagine that we could give you questions that, you know, we could give you the graph of a function and give you some information about it and, and tell you to, um, you know, compute the integral, even though you don't know exactly what the function is. So I still want you to be able to practice that, right? Very similar to like the assignment eight numeracy questions, right? When I gave you the areas and told you what the areas were, but I didn't tell you what the functions were, you know, stuff like that. The name of the shape, I mean, it's just generally, uh, so it is a technically a parallelogram, right? No, is it? No, it's not a parallelogram. Rhomboid? Yeah, is it a trapezoid? I don't remember. There's a classical definition. It's very trapezoidal. Right, it has four edges. I just don't remember if that's, there's a weird thing. I don't remember exactly what it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Uh, is Okay, so I got a direct message. Is there anything I have to worry about with zero? Like would I have to compute f of zero and add it to my area? It depends on what you mean by that. Um, Maybe when we take up the solution, you can, so a person who direct messaged me, maybe you can kind of point it out more. Basically though, the thing about areas is they don't care about individual points, right? Like individual points or, or sort of like straight lines are one dimensional areas don't affect the two dimensional area, right? Lengths don't add anything to area, if that makes sense. All right, so we're at uh, about 80%. Let's do another 15, 20 seconds. All right, very good. So 73% of you said C, which is absolutely the correct answer. The correct answer is 10. So let's take it up for those of you who didn't see it. Um, or maybe some of you might have you know, computed it if you know how, and I can show you how you do it without computing it. All right, so how do we do it? 
So what, what I'm going to do, so we're looking at the function f of x equals 2x plus 3. Maybe let me just write that out. f of x equals 2x plus 3. And we want to look at the area on the interval 0, 2. Right? So let's try and uh, draw this. So 1, 2. And you know it's not going to be like perfectly to scale. Let's just kind of draw it roughly. So at 0, I'm going to have a height of what, 3? Right? And then at 2, I'm going to have a height of 7. Right, is everyone OK with how I got those numbers? So the area I'm after here, I'm going to move 2 over just so that it works out. The area that we're after is this, right? Is it OK if we use Desmos to draw the graph? Yeah, I'd say that's probably OK. Yeah, I don't think there's a big issue there. Um, in this case, it's a line, so it's not too bad, right? Because with a line, if you get two points, you can just like put your ruler down and draw them. But if you want to use Desmos, you're, you're free to do that. The reality is, is that eventually, this isn't the way that we're going to compute integrals. So I don't want you to invest too much in figuring this out. Right now, it's just kind of getting familiar. The purpose of these questions is to get you all familiar with the notation and how to read these questions um, and do that. OK, great question. Um, so I have a direct message which says, how did you get 3 and 7? So this is 0. So right, if I want to look at where the function, like what is the height of the function when x is equal to 0, I'm going to compute what f of 0 is. And if I want to figure out where the function is at 2, I'm going to plug in 2. That's going to give me 2 times 2 plus 3, which is 7. Does that make sense? So that's how I got the numbers 3 and 7. I evaluated the function at 0 and at 2, because those are the endpoints of my interval. OK, so hopefully that makes sense. But if anyone needs me to explain it more, just let me know. OK, yeah, sounds like that's good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this into two shapes. Right, a rectangle and a triangle. And the rectangle right, has area, well, I've got a base of 2 and a height of 3, no problem. So 2 times 3, so that's going to give me 6. And then the red part is a triangle. And that's going to be 1 half times the base, which is 2, times the height. Now, you be careful here, right? It's easy to make a mistake. The height of this rectangle or of this triangle here is 4, right? Don't accidentally write down 7, because we're not going all the way to the bottom, right? We're going from 3 to 7. And so if you work that out, that's going to be, what, 8 divided by 2, so 4. And so the total area is 6 plus 4, which is 10. Right, and that was option C. OK, does that make sense? Uh, all right, let's do one more of these ones, and then we'll do something a little bit different. OK, but let's do one more of these sorts of, here's the graph, you tell me what the area is. If the area is not so easy to calculate, should we use the formula? Um, like the formula for this trapezoid or whatever shape this is? Is that what you're asking? I mean, I'm not typically going to, you know, I'm not going to ask you the area of, you know, something that looks like, you know, you can imagine I could give you something which looks like that. And you could probably go look up, you know, this rhombus or something and figure out what its area is. And there's some formula for it or something. Um, but that's not what I'm worried about, right? Like I said, kind of the purpose of this section is to get you to, again, be familiar with the notation, get familiar with if I get, I'm given an integral, how do I parse it, right? Like what is the interval of integration? What is the integrand of the function that I'm actually integrating? And what does that mean, right, if I graph it? Uh, is there a way to compute this without graphing? Yes, Muhammad, but we're not going to learn that until next week, right? Um, and so actually, you're kind of doing it as part of your numeracy. You actually kind of did it as part of your assignment 8 numeracy. But the formal theorem, which is going to tell you how we would actually do this, is, uh, is not going to occur until next week, OK?
And like I said, even for those of you who do know how to do it, I kind of want you to try and do it with the graph for now, just because I want you to get comfortable of thinking of these things as areas, okay? Because it is very much possible for me to kind of give you a question like that. Um, and I want you to be able to demonstrate that you understand what the question is asking, um, rather than again, just mindlessly computing, because you guys can go and you can plug this, all this stuff into Wolfram Alpha. And Wolfram Alpha just outputs you the answer, right? So I'm not super worried about how you compute these things as much as you understanding what are these things mean and how do they help us and, and what can we do with them, right? I think so that's, that's more of my objective here. And so this, this one should look familiar. Right, I made you do something like this in the numeracy. but what's a quadrilateral versus a rhombus versus a parallelogram? Christine, that's actually a totally okay question. I am certain I knew at some point, I probably couldn't tell you anymore. So I think, yeah, quadrilateral is anything with four sides. Uh, parallelogram is specifically, I think when the two of the four sides are parallel, right? And a rhombus, I guess, Jordan, you're saying is a special case of a parallelogram. Is that fair? Yep. It is, it is the square quote unquote parallelogram, right? Like if you took a, you imagine if you took a square and you just went and kind of sheared it, right? So there, if you took a square and then just kind of did that shear, then you would get uh, a, a rhombus. Yeah, but you know what? In practice, and that's something like- parallelogram also has to have opposite sides being equal. There you go. So, um, well, yeah, because otherwise they just won't be parallel, right? Something won't be parallel if the opposite sides aren't equal. Right? Because even if these two are parallel, but they have different lengths, then the other two yep. angles won't be parallel. Um, but yeah, like I'd say this is something the Greeks worried about. Uh, it's not something we're going to be super upset about. Um, so quadrilaterals is the name for all of those things. So quadrilaterals are just anything with four sides. So that, that picture that we drew the first time is neither a rhombus nor a parallelogram, but it did have four sides. And so it's a quadrilateral, right? We're thinking quad as in four. Um, and then a special case of quadrilaterals is parallelograms where you know they, they're a little bit more symmetric. I don't have the thing up, so I can't really draw them anymore, but they're more symmetric, but they don't have to have the same side lengths. And then in a rhombus, any object with four sides such that they are parallel and have the same side lengths. All four sides have the same length. All right, so yeah, no problem. And like I said, I don't, don't worry about it too much. It's not, you know, we're not gonna worry about it. I'm not gonna ask you to, I, I don't think I would use that language in particular because I'm certain that we have lots as well, lots of international students who would see rhombus and be like, I have no idea what a rhombus is. And I'd be like, that's fair. That's not something you should need to know Right, I don't remember what the definition of a rhombus is, so don't don't worry about it. Okay, we're at sixty percent. Um, I'll do thirty more seconds, so get those last sets of votes in, and we'll see where you're at. This is nice. We've got got a little split here. Okay, nice, nice. All right, so I'm going to end the polling. The way the final answer is written, what about it? I mean, yeah, it's true. There's a couple of ways you could write the final answer. So you kind of have to figure out which of the ones written if you did write it in a different way. We've got pretty much a three-way tie here between A, B, C, and D. 
Um, yeah, that's true. There's definitely some work to match. Uh, I don't think hey, so rooms are necessarily going to help this one. Well, we'll see. Okay, <laughs> so there. I I think we are going to do breakout rooms for this one because what I think it is is some people just read the question too quickly, right? And so even if uh, it's just to have your classmates be like, oh hey dude, you you wrote the you read it wrong. Uh, I think that will be useful. Okay, so I'm only going to put you guys in there for a minute or so. Or I'm going to put you guys in there for a minute or so, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, maybe. It's hard to say. I know that there are definitely some rooms that do talk, and there are some rooms that don't. And I, I couldn't tell you. And I've tried to kind of compensate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, be the change you want to see in the world, right? Be a leader, take a leadership role. <laughs> I mean, I, his, I would like to, I would like to point out, I spend most of the lecture talking to myself. <laughs> right, almost no one, like there's a, a little bit of response in the chat and every now and then Jordan pipes in, but you know. What did you miss? Um, well, we are working on the question. You should be able to see it on your screen because I think it's still shared. So we're working on this question and we got a big split. So, you know, basically a third of the class at A, a third of the class at C, a third of the class at D. So I threw them all in breakout rooms just for a little bit. Uh, and then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna re, re vote. We'll kind of see what people, see what people say. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who stayed, because this is going to be our little breakout room, one thing I'd like to point out here is take a look at, uh, at the bounds of integration, right? So this says that we're going to start at A and go to B1, right? So we're not actually computing the area of this entire trapezoid, right? We're starting the computation right here, right? We're starting at A. So if we start at A, we're really only looking at the area to the right of this, right? Right, 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 right. And so that, you know, if you take the whole area, you're going to get a different answer than if you just take the area to the right of this. And so this is what I'm saying. I want you guys to get familiar and get comfortable reading these bounds, because if these bounds change, you're going to get a different answer, right? Um, so take a second and, and maybe do redo your computations and keep that in mind. No, no, I mean that's yeah, no, you you notice exactly the right thing, right? Those bounds of integration are important. So I'm gonna start to bring people back here. Because I think it's actually been two and a half minutes. Just waiting on a few stragglers, but for the rest of you, you can get those votes in. Right, Mika, yes, the interval is A to B1, right? And that's important. That changes the answer. I'm actually going to start drawing this on my thing so that when we talk about it, I don't have to draw it.
Okay. Uh, 78%, 10, 15 seconds, get those last ones in. this share. All right. So interestingly, we have switched our, you know, consensus away from D and into C. It's not quite where I'd like, but that's fine. We'll go over it. C is the correct answer for so, so those of you who have said C, it absolutely is C. Um, and kind of, yeah, it's C, right? Okay. So yeah, the important thing, everyone, to pay attention here, right? Like I said, one of the things that I want us to do as part of what we're doing here is to get used to the notation. And the important thing to see here is where, what bounds of integration did I give you, right? I didn't say find it from zero to B1. What I did is I said the lower bound of integration is A, which means that you're actually going to start your integral right here, right? Yeah. So what, so, but this is an important lesson here, right? Like how many of you just saw the question, like kind of just read it really, really quickly, you know, and just like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And just, I, you know, I did this in the numeracy and just started to write it down, right? Like write down the answer without reading it carefully. Tell me, well, no, no, the numeracy didn't say to start at A though, Yemen, right? So like you're, you're okay on that. The, the numeracy one, if you did it, it, that's fine. But what I'm trying to say is you can very much imagine that I could have given you this question as a test question, right? And I think a lot of people would have made that mistake. And why? Because you didn't read the question carefully, right? And I mean, if you did read the question carefully and you just made a mistake, that's, that's one thing. Um, but what I suspect and what does happen a lot and where the majority of these kind of you know, silly mistakes to make are, is you're like, boom, I know how to do this. And you don't really read the question and you just write down an answer. So right, moral of the lesson, just take your time, make sure that you read the question carefully and really understand what it's saying, because this is a bit... Well, David, don't worry about it. I mean, it's not worth anything. It's better to kind of like learn that mistake now, right? But read the questions, read them carefully because this would be a bad place to lose marks, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I want you all to be honest with yourself. How many of you would have made this mistake? And then tell me that you wouldn't have been kicking yourself after, right? I would have said, look, the integral is from A to B1. You'd be like, oh, damn, that was, that was dumb. It's a bad place to lose marks, right? Read the question. What would it have cost you to re read the question uh, properly, right? An extra five seconds, right? Is that worth it to lose marks? No way, right? So just read it carefully. All right, so here's here's the uh, the question that I gave you. And I'm willing to bet now, now that you know it's from A to B1, many more people would get the correct answer. But because the integral is from A to B1, right? So what do we want here? We want the integral from A to B1 of this function. So that means that the area I'm interested in is this thing right here, right? And so of course you can, if you want, there's a bunch of different ways that you could do this. You could compute the area of the, uh, you know, the rectangle and then add on to that the area of the triangle. Or for those of you who know what the area of the full trapezoid is, you could just subtract half of that, the, the, the portion of the triangle that isn't included. Right, any of those is fine. Um, but basically, so actually the way I would do it is I would take the answer which I know is true and subtract um, uh, the triangle, but you, you can do it however you want. So the area of the trapezoid, so the full trapezoid has area, uh, okay, so what, is the full area. So it's A plus B2 times H, right? So hopefully you guys got something similar in your numeracy. And you don't have to write it like that. There are other things that you could have done. Uh, you could have actually, you know, gotten rid of the A's and written it entirely at B1 and B2, and that, that would have been okay. Um, and then what I'm going to do is subtract the this rectangle, okay? So I'm going to subtract this yellow rectangle. the yellow rectangle. rectangle has area uh, 1 half A times H. So the total area, I can see the chat going, I'll look up in a second. So the total area is A plus B2H minus A 
uh, one half of a h over two, and that's a over two plus b two h like that. The chat is nothing important. Okay, it's just people. <laughs> yeah, don't look. It's just people doing uh, emojis. Okay. Yeah, or yeah, absolutely. Treat it as a rectangle and a triangle and simplify. Maya, absolutely, you could do that. And that's a great way of doing it. I see profit in the shaded area. That, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Uh, what did I say? Yellow triangle. You're right. Thank you. Yellow triangle. Triangle. Absolutely. Um, okay, everyone. Right. So again, read the question carefully. Right. You don't want to make a mistake like this. It's a silly place to make a mistake. Um, okay, we probably get one more in. Uh, yeah, okay, let's do something. Here's something a little bit more computational. Maybe you guys are sick of looking at graphs and stuff. So maybe here's something a little different. And for those of you, right, I can't remember if uh, who asked, maybe I think it might have been Muhammad, but somebody asked, um, all right, how is there a way of computing these without graphing them? And so interestingly, I, so we introduce integration and then we stop and don't talk about integration anymore. We kind of, you know, veer wildly off the road and start talking about antiderivatives. And I wonder if those could be related. Uh, okay, Sarah, hold on. So, hey, some, so uh, you don't know, right? I mean, it depends. The, the constant, obviously, we don't have enough information to know what the constant should be. So in this case, the multiple choice is really, really important. Uh, maybe. I mean, that's the same thing as asking me which is the correct answer. But yes, yes, if you chose that option, then that is the correct value of C, if that makes sense. OK. Uh, Sarah, what's a weird food combo? <laughs> a weird food combo I like. I don't know. Um, oh, you know, uh, isn't the trapezoid 1 half top plus base times height? Um, I think that is true, yes. Um, but notably, the top height there, it was B2, right? So if you wanted to write it in terms of B1 and B2, uh, Tian, you absolutely could have. Um, but the answers had all had A's in them. So you had to kind of rewrite it in terms of A, if that makes sense. Um, Hassan was asking about the constant, right? So we know that if you've done the antiderivative reading, you know that antiderivatives aren't unique, right? You have a different additive constant. So he was asking about the constant. Yeah. Yes, I do like pineapple on pizza. That's a love-hate thing. It's a dangerous question that you're asked. You know, I've now made a lot of enemies in this class. Um, Pineapple is like any pizza topping. It only goes on certain types of pizza. Uh, yeah, for sure. That's true. I had a friend who really loved peaches and insisted that peach on a, on a pineapple would be phenomenal. Um, Do you mean I peach could, on a pizza? Yeah, or yeah, sorry, on a, on a pizza. I, I could see that maybe working if it was the right kind of pizza. Um, my wife gives me hell because sometimes if I'm feeling like if I've got a sweet tooth, I'll just mix honey and peanut butter and eat that straight. Um, so I think that's the thing that uh, she gives me those hell about. So that's probably it. I've had oh, come on. On pizza before, and that's delicious on the right uh, <laughs> thing. Okay, wait a second. So I'm getting hell for this. Okay, but let's be clear. So if I mixed peanut butter and honey and put it on 
a piece of bread, it would be fine. Yeah, but okay, so removing the bread. And Christine, I definitely do the same thing with Nutella, right? Just take the spoon, put it right into the Nutella, and then just eat it off the spoon, 100%. I've definitely done that as well. It's so, you feel so guilty though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Stephanie, that's true. That might be true. <laughs> I mean, are we talking about like a Heinz ketchup or like good ketchup? I mean, I don't, either way, you just shouldn't be drinking ketchup, I think, right? Like that's true. I, my best friend's wife loves to like just drink butter. Like she just 100% for whatever reason is all about drinking butter. It's like, the does most, she melt it first? Yeah, but she'll eat it as well if you give it to her, like just as a as a brick. Um, and Please tell it, me it's at least salted. Uh, I don't think she cares. It, I don't. If it's I don't think unsalted she butter, that's even more heinous. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty it's gross. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's it's super gross. <laughs> she'll do it as a trick, and then my best friend just glares at her the whole time. It's 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 super gross. No, okay, so um, there's a place in Toronto. For, so for those of you who aren't here, eventually when you get here, there's a place called uh, North of Brooklyn, and they have something called the Killer Bee, uh, which does put honey on their pizza, and it's phenomenal, the way they do it. It's very subtle, but, like, the way they do it is very great. If you ever get a chance, North of Brooklyn is, like, a Toronto um, chain. Barbecue sauce on pizza, again, depends on the type of uh, yeah. pizza. If we're talking about Spicy, in place of yeah. tomato sauce and doing like a barbecue uh, style pizza, yeah, it's great. Yeah, right. Lots of crazy things that end up working out. Pizza flavored pizza. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's the sort of thing that there's a little bit of dead air. And so, because, you know, I want you guys to work on your the, the problem. But once you're done working on the problem, we can talk. You sure the answers are correct? So Chief Eng, you don't think the answer is here? The answer is 100% there. I mean, I could be, like, we could be wrong, but we'll figure it out as we go. No, I, 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 I verified it's there. Okay. Ketchup on rice, that seems blasphemous. My father always loved to put soy sauce on rice, but then my mother gave him hell for that, but he did it anyway. Hell it. Pineapple, jalapeno, chicken, barbecue base. Okay, interesting. It seems like it'd be a little, a little too sweet. Like that's that's a really. I would sweet drop pizza. the pineapple for like some red onion. I think. Yeah, maybe the barbecue base for me is just really, really sweet. You know what I mean? It tends to like punch you in the face as a pizza sort of thing. I know some people like it, but and and in moderation, it's okay. But I couldn't eat a whole pizza like that. Closest you got. Ah, uh, be careful though. Uh, Chi Feng, right? When you think about what an antiderivative for 10 to the S is. You want to be really careful about that. Um, okay, so we're at 65%. Let's do another 30 seconds and then uh, and then we'll reel it in. We'll see how it goes. Do people put ketchup on their French toast? People put ketchup on front toast, French toast? Uh, apparently. Ugh. Syrup for sure. Or, you know, fruit. If you just have like a bunch of fruit um, and put that on like that's great as well um yeah yeah i think french toast is supposed to maybe be sweet. a little icing sugar oh yeah for sure yeah uh maybe some whipped cream yeah but not definitely not ketchup what that's weird red bean on french toast i think that could work yeah it'd be good uh dessert pizzas i it's been i don't even had a dessert pizza in like 20 years but i enjoyed them when i was younger for sure as long as they change the dough a bit it's good you can't walking. just use regular like pizza dough. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't remember what they do. I don't I don't think they do that. Uh, wash your bread. No, no, I can't say that I've ever washed my bread. I don't even know what that would, how you would do that. The <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we are on track. We were just letting the last uh, the last bit of it go. Okay. Um. So we have. Uh, very much in the A's, uh, A's, uh, A is the correct answer, at least as far as last time I checked, A was the correct answer. So let's see why. Now, if it's multiple choice, okay, if it's multiple choice, you can actually just differentiate each of these functions, right? Um, alternatively, though, what you can do Something that would actually have given away the answer, because again, it is multiple choice, is you could just find the antiderivative of one over root s, 
right? Mm -hmm. So let's maybe do that separately first. So uh, an antiderivative, antiderivative of one divided by the square root of s. Uh, okay, so I'm going to rewrite this as s to the negative one. Oh, that's not s to the negative one half like that. Okay, so we know an antiderivative. So we know an antiderivative, and we're not going to worry about the constant until the very end of s to the n is s to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, right? So in this case, we're going to get s to the negative 1 half plus 1 divided by negative 1 half plus 1. That's going to be s to the 1 half divided by 1 half. That's 2 times the square root of s is an antiderivative for 1 over root s. OK? And basically, once you have that, you're done, right? There's only one of these four options that have two root s in it, and it's option A. Now, let's suppose, though, that it wasn't multiple choice, right? You actually just had to do the whole thing. So let's do the second part. So let's find an antiderivative for 10 to the s. An antiderivative for 10 to the s. OK, so the thing about 10 to the s is you have to think about what the derivative. I think I wrote it down in the table of antiderivatives what the answer is. But let me say this. So we know that the derivative of 10 to the s is ln 10 times 10 to the s, right? So when you differentiate 10 to the s, you get back 10 to the s possibly up to a constant. You thought it was the exponential. What did you think was the exponential? Chifeng, can you clarify that a little bit more? Or you thought it was like s to the 10? Because if it's s to the 10, definitely. Yeah, if it's s to the 10, you get something more like c, right? Where you do kind of what we had above. But remember, when you have like the base is the number and the exponent is the variable, then you get something like e to the x, right? Think about it like that. So e to the x and 10 to the x are the same function. It's just you've used a different number as the base, right? So instead of 2.71828, a blah, 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 you use the number 10, right? So you want to differentiate them in a similar way. And so what this says, now what we want is we just want 10 to the s over here, right? We're trying to find an antiderivative for 10 to the s. So I just want 10 to the power of s on the right-hand side. Isn't the antiderivative 10 to the x over? Yes, it is. So Sarah, this is what I'm actually saying. So what I need to do is I'm going to take this ln 10 and I'm going to put it on the other side. But when I do that, I have to divide by it, right? Right, so that tells me, so 10 to the S over ln 10 is, and I'm just going to write antiderivative AD. Uh, for 10 to the s, right? So in total, uh, our potential antiderivative is this. f of x is 10 to the s over ln 10 plus 2 root s plus some constant c. Now, you don't know what the constant c is. The question did give you a bunch of constants, right? Negative 4, 10 pi squared, e, yada, yada, yada. In this case, the constant that we gave you was negative 4, but of course, it doesn't matter. Right? When you differentiate the constant, it just becomes zero. So it doesn't affect the antiderivative. So this gives you the answer of A. OK? Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Can I zoom out? Sure. There you go. Can I differentiate 4 to the x? Sure. So the derivative. Do you want to actually see how it's done in general, Chi Feng? And that way you'll, you can see what it, yeah, OK. So the way that you do a to the x, OK, here a is a constant, is you do the derivative. What you're going to do is you're going to write this as e to the ln a to the power of x, right? Because e and ln cancel each other out, right? They're inverses of one another. And the benefit of doing this is that 
right? I haven't even differentiated yet. Is that I can write that like that, right? And now I just different, it's e to the like 4x or 5x, it's some constant, right? It's e to cx, where c is a constant. The derivative of that is ln a e to the x ln a. And this thing, if you turn it back into a to the x, you just get a to the x like that, OK? So that's that that works for any value of a that you could possibly want. And if you want to let a be 4 and kind of retry that computation, you absolutely can. And you can see that that works out. Yeah, no problem. But so that's how that's where that derivation comes from uh, in the first place, right? That's how you differentiate a to the x. OK, any other questions? So hopefully you guys are, uh, you know, you have to be a little bit careful. I want to say just, you know, I, you have all the derivative rules in your brain and now you're being asked to do antiderivatives, right? So you're going to have to go backwards. You have to, you have to do the opposite. Um, now differentiation is relatively straightforward because you, you have the form, the, the function, and you just have to figure out, okay, is this a product, a composition, whatever the case is, and you apply your rules and you get the derivative. Uh, taking antiderivatives is significantly harder right? Significantly harder. Um, because, for example, does anyone know, right? And again, for those of you who have to leave, obviously you have to leave. I'm just going to put this out there as maybe a mind twister. Uh, what is an antiderivative Is it going to be of 1x? Of 1x, exactly. Right. Does anyone know an antiderivative of ln x? Mm. That's the derivative, Sarah. Right. So I'm asking. Uh, yes, that is right, Jordan. So I'm asking you, what do you differentiate to get ln x? Not what do you get if you differentiate ln x, but what function do you differentiate so that ln x is the answer? Uh, okay, but the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? So e to the 1 is a constant, so you'd get 0. The derivative of e to the 1 is 0. Any other guesses? It's tough, right? There is one. It exists. It's not too hard. No more guesses, eh? It's a tough one. It's a tough one for sure. One of the okay, one to the power of x, derivative of one to the x though is zero, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? Like what what could you differentiate to get ln x out? Yeah, you, well, I mean, Saif, you're, there's an, it's kind of supposed to make you get lost, right? Like, part of what I'm trying to show you is that anti-differentiation can be quite difficult, even if I give you a relatively easy function. Sarah, if you differentiate one, you get zero, right? It's a constant. E to the ln x is just x of the remand, so if you differentiate that, you just get one. Ah, Mika, how did you get that? Yes, yeah, so Kevin, the derivative of x is 1, right? Not ln x. Mika, how did you get x ln x minus x plus c? The for what formula? Oh, I see. <laughs> OK, yeah, from high school, sure. So yeah, everyone. So from Mika's high school, which will be our source. So let's just do x ln x minus x, right? And let's check. So the derivative of this, we have to use the product rule. So we're going to differentiate the first function. Right? We get d dx of x 
ln x. So derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So that's going to be x times the derivative of ln x minus 1, right? So this part is just the derivative of x ln x. And look at what happens. You're going to get ln x plus x over x minus 1 equals ln x. Yes, Mika, exactly. Yeah, integration by parts. So that works, right? You can always check, right? That's the great thing about antiderivatives is you can always just check your answer. All you have to do is differentiate. And if you get the thing out, you're supposed to get out great, phenomenal, right? Like, you know, you can check that your answer is always correct. So here's the interesting thing, though, right? That an antiderivative of x ln x or an antiderivative of ln x is x ln x minus x. Yeah, how do you find that? So Hasem, that is something that we are going to talk about. And I will show you how to get this in particular. But I think that you can probably appreciate that this doesn't seem as straightforward as maybe differentiation is, right? Like this is actually, it is a little bit harder to compute. Um, and, and so again, my intent here is not to like freak anyone out, but it's just to say, you, you do have to take this seriously. You need to know your derivatives down because you're gonna, you have to know those in order to be able to take antiderivatives. And then the things that we learn uh, the, the, you know, the rules that we learn for integrating are a fair bit more difficult than the, the rules that we learn for differentiating. Uh, so it ends up being a little bit more complicated. So this, as Mika points out, the answer is to integrate by parts. And, and I will teach you how to integrate by parts either next week or the week after, I don't remember. And integration by parts is the product rule backwards, right? So if antiderivatives is undoing a derivative, you can imagine that the rules that we learn will be to undo the rules of differentiation. We're going to learn two techniques. One is called substitution, which is the to do the chain rule backwards. And the other is integration by parts, which is to do the product rule backwards. Um, and so integration by parts is the correct way of doing this. But we, we don't know that yet. We'll get to it. OK, my point here is just things are weird. Is there a more complicated antiderivative for this? Uh, for, you mean for ln x, or do you want me to give you just a more complicated antiderivative question? Real quick right now, I mean, I could. I don't know if it would make any sense. Or do you just like want to see what it looks like? Well, here, let me write it out, so. Uh, UB minus integral V DU, so I'm going to get DX, so X times DX over X, so that's X on X minus the integral DX, so it's X on X minus X plus C. Oh, OK, yeah, sure. Does that make sense then? Do you see what it is? Right, so integration by parts is the integral of uh, v du is u v, uh, u v minus integral, no, so u dv, u dv, v du. Right. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, oh, a more complicated question, sure. Uh, what's an antiderivative? e to the x squared. Uh, 
And this is actually really important. Yeah, Selena, you absolutely can leave. This isn't this isn't important at all. So cheaping is your answer also e to the x squared. That it's a, its own end. Okay, so differentiate e to the x squared for me. What do you get? Right, okay. So Ishneet, e to the just two x. So if you differentiate e to the two x, what do you get? No, it's okay. No, it's kind of, I can see what you're doing, right? Because you're like, okay, I, like, you're trying to account for this X that you know is supposed to be there and you're trying to like change things, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's tricky, right? See you, Luke. Probably don't need to keep recording. I don't think anyone else is going to.